you, you're probably answering my question of what, what are your days like? <laughs> oh, yeah, we kind of did. I mean, dog walking, pantry food, perusing, bread baking. <laughs> we're actually, we're, we're trying to continue the writer's room. How's that looking? It is very different. It is very different. It is in some ways more intense because you don't have any distraction and you can't talk to your neighbor and you can't like, I, I guess you could jump up and go to the kitchen, but um, you hate to leave this position. So, so it's been super intense, but I have to be honest, it's really hard to imagine into the character's future when you don't have a sense of what your future is going to be. Mm. So it's been challenging. That's interesting. I, you know, wanted to kind of kick it off with just how uh, writing for streaming has really impacted the way you develop and write shows. You know, you both have worked in writing for cable and for network um, and, you know, how maybe this, the pandemic, but on top of that, just new learning new platforms and new changing formats, how that's impacted your work. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I'm, I'm happy to jump in and, and, you know, feel free to interrupt me at any point, Marta. Um, but thank first of all, I wanna thank you guys, the Writers Guild for setting this up. And I just wanna send out, you know, um, thoughts and prayers to everyone who's listening. Thanks you guys for, for checking in. It's a real pleasure to be able to see human faces and to have conversations um, in this time. So thanks guys for, for this opportunity. Um, you know, for me, I went from like Marta, you know, started out in network television and then went to, to cable and then went to streaming. And then now I'm my new projects at Quibi, which is a whole other thing. Um, so it feels like I was just talking to someone about this the other day. Um, the form sometimes defines the content. Um, and, you know, for, for my work, definitely. But I think, you know, as a species in storytelling, you know, that we get to evolve as the form itself changes and morphs. So going from, you know, the, I mean, just really rudimentary, you know, 60 minute, you know, act out, you know, three to four to five acts, you know, act out, you know, episode out, sit around for a week, come back, get repeated, half the things that you learned a week ago, but forgot, you know, we don't do that anymore, right? It's unheard of. Um, at least for the majority of, of television writers who are now working in the streaming space, because we just were consuming consecutively. So that as writers makes our, I mean, for me, the job much more pleasurable um, because you can keep writing, you know, and never having to go back and repeat, repeat, repeat things that people already know. Um, but also it just allows you to be more novelistic, you know, in the approach to the, to the work and the characters' lives. And, um, and I, I think in addition to that, it allows, um, it allows you to have the story organically tell you what the structure is. Mm -hmm. um, when you're not bound by this is how many minutes you can do before the first commercial, and this is how many minutes you can do before the second commercial, and you have to have act outs for each of these things, and it's structured differently. Um, we don't have to do that when we're streaming um, because we have a half an hour and we can, on Netflix at least, go to 27 minutes, go to 28 minutes, go to 29 minutes. The story will tell us. And that is a real pleasure um, to have the story tell you anything. And I, I remember early on, too, when The Killing first went to Netflix, having conversations with with them and with other writers, you know, who were just developing for Netflix, that the streaming space itself allows us, because we're not obligated because of commercial reasons to do, you know, half an hour, you know, 29 minutes or, or 59 minutes, that what if an episode was five minutes? What if an episode was 90 minutes? What if an epi episode, you know, like, so all of a sudden we're having those conversations because, all the rules um, that existed before and were taken as a matter of course were gone in the streaming space. Um, it also, it allows you to tell stories slightly differently, certainly in the half hour space where 
Um, we were so used to, especially on network where they didn't really want arcs mm -hmm. because once you syndicated, um, it looked completely different. So now we're at a place where um, they want the arcs. You don't have to finish every story by the time the half hour is up. Um, you can spread them out over the course of an entire season. And that way it makes it much easier um, to expand the storytelling. Has your process changed at all from the first season of Grace, Frank, of Grace and Frankie to the seventh season, Marta? Um, yes, to a certain extent it has. The process has changed in that, you know, we had to figure out a couple of things. We had to figure out exactly what line we walked between mm -hmm. comedy and whatever drama we wanted to have in there. So we had to sort of figure that out. Once we figured that out and we understood what we needed from a writer's room, it took us a few years to realize we worked better in smaller groups rather than mm -hmm. all together, we could get more accomplished. Um, I'm always running to the set and running to see costumes and running to look at set dressing. Um, so I can't stay in the room 100% of the time. How about you, Vina? Um, well, I, have a, I have a quick point of procedure in this whole new world of doing things online. So sh there are questions coming up on the chat. Should oh. we reference them at all or, or should we just kind of, I'm cool Absolutely. with Absolutely, if you see a yeah. question that kind of jumps at you, for sure. Yeah, you know, I mean, there are a lot of great questions here. I, I'll just jump into kind of the one of the first ones I saw, which was about Quibi. Um, and it kind of loops back to your first question, Edith. Um, so the Quibi model, which I think is is fascinating for a lot of different reasons. For, for those who don't know, it's uh, it's a new platform that's coming out in April, and it is Jeffrey Katzenberg's, you know, uh, beautiful brainchild of an idea of how to revolutionize, um, or at least add to the way we look at at storytelling. And it's uh, it's a platform that you put on your phone and you watch ten minutes for every episode is 10 minutes and they drop every day. So you'll be watching, you know, whatever, a 12, 13 episode series over the course of 14 days um, or 16 days because weekends aren't counted. So that in and of itself introduced, again, you know, having gone from the cable space to Netflix and then how those rules opened up a whole new way of thinking, at least about storytelling, the Quibi model of the 10 minute story episode just kind of blew my mind because it was, you know, um, in some ways it is, we're so used to the 10 minute act in television. So that felt very familiar, but these are episodes that have to stand on their own and be satisfying on their own. Um, and they drop so quickly that mm -hmm. the outs for those episodes have to be novel. You know, the repetition, you'll, the audience will start to see the scenes because the space between each episode is so much shorter, it's 10 minutes. So um, that was really fascinating to think in terms of how do I do a propulsive story that is that has pretty intense act outs at the end of every episode, but it doesn't become repetitive. Um, and so it became for the writers, uh, you know, for, for people writing for this new platform, somewhat of a hybrid between the three act structure in films and what we usually do in television, um, the episodic. So that was really fun to play with. That was completely fascinating. And not to mention the whole vertical frame, which kind of threw us all for a loop um, in how to you, tell a story. Yeah. In you also story. directed, right? I did, yeah, yeah. One of the questions that someone asked that sort of refers back to something that Vina and I were talking about a little earlier, um, they were asking about the conversation with the producers when we say we want this episode to be 35 minutes or we want that episode to be 26 minutes. Um, I Two things to say about that. One of them is the way Netflix works, um, at least in, in our case, and I believe in most cases, is here's the budget for the season. Now you figure out how do you, you wanna use that budget. And if you wanna do a shorter episode and then you wanna do a longer episode, 
you know, it has to all come out in the wash. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is most places have a minimum and a maximum. So, um, I mean, Netflix, I think the minimum has to be 26 minutes. Yeah. But it still provides us with the opportunity to let the story tell us how long it's going to be. Someone also asked, you know, how do you, um, well, I guess in, in thinking about the timing of that, because, you know, you go from Quibi, who, who 10 minutes is the max, correct? And also, you know, you're all, we're already having the conversations within each streaming platform about length. Um, do you see a time where, you know, there's going to be almost both because Quibi is very mobile friendly and streamer, streamers are also kind of looking to capture audiences on a mobile platform. Is there going to be some sort of hybrid between those two, I guess, structures? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the question is what is our appetite as an audience, right? Like, what do we want? And it feels like uh, streamers, the streaming world created this incredibly, this, this petri dish where all of us as consumers have got, gotten the, the uh, intelligence IQ of America and the whole world has just shot up just because we're actually getting really smart shows that we maybe to some degree, again, the repetition of your, we're not having to go through that. So we get to, you know, and I heard John Wells say this once, he said, right, as though the audience is far more intelligent than you, um, which I think is happening now, which is a great pleasure. And so it feels like that necessitated a certain type of storytelling in the streaming world. And, um, and then now, because everyone's binging so much, um, there's a hunger now maybe for shorter things, right? Like we're also seeing the, in the, in the time, in the golden age of the binge, the 20 hour binge, when you can sit on your couch, all we, and we're all sitting on our couches now, but you know, back in the day when you could sit there for 20 hours and it was fun and optional, um, you know, there was also the advent of like now the 30 minute drama. So things getting smaller because maybe sometimes people are feeling overwhelmed. And so now, you know, in the pandemic, we've got a whole, all of us are watching TikToks like nonstop. I don't know if you guys are, but it's amazing how many people are watching TikTok mm -hmm. and how is that going to affect our attention span and our desire for content that then is, we can look at really quickly. I do ultimately wonder, um, and this is a Writers Guild question, how shorter and shorter lengths of episodes will have, what, what effect that will have on the writers mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, being able to remain employed if some of them are, you know, four minute episodes and there's, however many of them, and then that, is that gonna be enough to make a living? Or do you also have to have something that has, that's on the air? I, you know, it's just, it's, it's a Writers Guild arena question. Yeah, it's definitely a conversation that they're going to have in these upcoming talks and negotiations, I'm sure. Um, I'm curious how, uh, it, how do you pitch a streaming service such as Netflix, such as Quibi, such as Disney Plus? I don't think the pitch is any different. Um, I, I, I think you need to make it clear when you're doing something like Netflix that is going to launch the whole series at the same time, <clears throat> that <laughs> you're clear that, the that there is an arc to the season but in general, I think you still have to, you have to sell the characters, you have to sell the idea, you have to sell the story, you have to sell people wanting to invest in, in the elements that you're putting together. Um, so I don't think the pitch is all that different. What do you think, Vina? What was your pitch for Quibi? Okay. Uh I mean, it, it ultimately is the same, you know, it's, it's the same animal, but you know, net, my, my, my show, TV shows were, you know, 13 hour seasons versus, you know, a 10 minute, you know, a movie 
uh, which Quibi ultimately is, it's 120 minutes for the season. So um, the arcs were, uh, you know, there were, you have a little bit less real estate in 120 minutes than you do in 13 hours. So by necessity, the 13 hours required multiple arcs, you know, ensemble casts, at least, you know, for the killing to some degree and, and for seven seconds. The Quibi project was one main character hitting obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, you know, over the course of one night. Um, so yeah, the real estate was, was, was smaller. Now, are you um, developing projects based on, uh, with a specific platform in mind? Go ahead, Marta. <clears throat> um, yes and no. Um, some projects that you just have in your heart, um, you have to develop that project and hope you can find a place to sell. Some projects um, fall very easily into the brand of different networks and streaming services. Um, and it just makes sense to go there. It just mm -hmm. It's a good fit. Um, I, I, but, but there are some things that you know from the start, they're not gonna work on Disney Plus, or that's not, you just know that. So there's no point in going there. So you have to sort of find, Netflix has the widest range of things. Um, so there isn't a lot of, you can't go to Netflix for something. Um, but in general, there is a brand, or at least they're trying to make one. I remember you saying in an interview, Marta, that you know Netflix isn't really going for a, a long, uh, aren't, going for long series, you know, how does that affect writers who want to, you know, pitch for them or, or create a series for them? You know, um, there will be an economic effect because you can't make enough episodes to go into syndication. Um, uh, there are many things to be worked out over the next period of time. Um, however, it could be three seasons of work and really fun work that you want to do. Um, which if, if you do a good show, it's not going to be bad for your career. Mm -hmm. And as some, you know, writers that or questions that we always get, like, you know, how far ahead should they start, um, envisioning the series, you know? What, what do you suggest, like, do you, does it matter how, you know, far in advance, do they have to prep for five seasons? Are the, have the rules changed in that regard? I actually think the answer may be different between me and Vina. Vina, you wanna try first? Yeah, I, I felt over the course of um, going, you know, from, from the cable space to streaming, that the appetite for multiple, knowing what you're doing for multiple seasons has grown. So going into, you know, this is a full, rich, big pitch for season one. Here are all the characters. Here's where we leave them. Here's what's going to happen in season two, you know, less intense, but a lot of information and then this is where they're going to go season three um so yeah it, it didn't seem that we i would ever have to i would ever be able to just say season one guys let me i'll figure it out two and three um they wanted more for sure and i think with um with comedies it's a little different because our engine is different um, so I think you have to know that the show has legs and that it feels like there could be a landing point, but I don't know that you have to do the same kind of advanced thinking as you do with dramas. And actually I'm, I'm working on a drama and that's exactly what we had to do was come up with three clear seasons. Mm -hmm. Can you both talk a bit about production? 
you know, not another part of your job is producing your show and just your experiences with that, you know, what kind of skills that you feel like writers now should really develop if they want to play this game. I love that part. I gotta say, I love that part of my job. I love, and this is connected to being a showrunner, that there is a vision which touches all the departments. All the departments come up with something that they feel is related to that vision. Give me your three favorite things and together we come up with answers. Um, I love producing. I would say that I think everybody needs to take acting classes. Hmm. Because part of your job is to make sure that what you've written is exhibited. And if you can't talk to your actors or talk to a director in actors' terms, then you can't necessarily get the performances that you need. But those are all my favorite part. I love doing all that. I love looking at the tiles we're going to put in Brianna's new house. And, you know. <laughs> On top of that, I mean, I think that's super smart, Martha, and I 100% agree. Um, knowing how to get a performance or at least know what to ask for um, and not be irritating, you know, and not be confusing and give an actor conflicting information or conflicting intentions is really important. Um, or too much information. Um, Cause as showrunners too, you, you know, part of what I like to do is sit with my actors and give them an overview of what's to come um, over the course of the season. But there is some, there is such a thing as too much information that then just becomes confusing and they start playing that instead of, you know, where they are right now. Um, a, a, an important, I love production too, and I love directors and being able to talk to your directors is so key. Um, and, and take off the writer hat and put on showrunner producer hat. And the same way you have incredible sensitivity to what language an actor speaks, have that same sensitivity and knowledge with a director. Um, so being able to give very, to play in their sandbox as well, I think elicits um, great work from them. So uh, I've, seen, I've seen it happen both ways and, um, that's, a, that's, an, that's an impo super important relationship to me. Um, I agree with you 100%. It is a very important relationship. It is a collaborative relationship. So you don't want to create any sort of tension. Um, I want to say, Justin, a, co a comment to what you were just saying. Sam Waterston doesn't want to know where the character is going. He doesn't want to know the next episode. He wants to be in the present and that's it. He doesn't want to know, which is very interesting because some, because Jane and Lily do want to know. Yeah. Yeah. And just, and just asking them like, what, what yeah. do you, you know, this is what I'm thinking at lunch, blah, blah, blah. This is nice. And would you like me to tell you um, or not? Yeah. And they're like, uh, no, yes. You know, um, but yeah, a lot of times it's it's interesting. Everyone has their own process. Yeah, yeah. And I want to say, you know, the Vina was talking about how we treat directors and how we converse with directors and how we create a, a, a trusting and respectful collaboration with directors. I think it is equally important to create that collaboration with your writers on your staff. That it is a collaborative process that is democratic until it somehow steps away from the vision. Um, and that people deserve to know what they did well as well as what needs to be improved upon. Um, and I think it's really important. I, I believe wholeheartedly in a happy set. You want a happy set. Everyone should get respect. Everybody has input. I mean, even the guy, the, the gaffer who says, you know what, what if we put a moon out there? 
everybody has input and everybody needs to be treated as if their input is equally important. Um, so I just wanted to add that onto what Vina was saying. What types of stories are you both interested in reading when, it, when you're looking to hire your writer's room? Um, for me, it, um, it, it matters. The material drives that. So I'll be looking usually for a very specific uh, voice or a very specific experience, um, depending again on the show and what's going on. Uh, short stories have always been a great way to um, get in the door without taxing because usually I'll have so much to read at the beginning of a show that you know reading a 60 page reading something that's a pilot or reading a 120 page screenplay is exhausting and um, a short story for me or a one act play really gives me the flavor of who a writer is um, and then also gives me a start and a finish versus just you know 10 to 20 pages I have to agree. I, I, screenplay is my least favorite thing to read. Um, I'll do it if someone highly recommends someone, but it's my least favorite thing to read when I'm looking for a writer. The other thing that, I mean, short stories don't work for me as well um, because, well, they just don't work for me as well and neither do articles or tweets. Um, what works for, I love, um, plays. I will read someone's own pilot. I'll read um, someone's spec script. Don't send me your friends. I don't know if you feel this way, Vina, about your shows. Don't send me the show I know better than anyone else because <laughs> it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Yeah. And um, the other thing I would say, I mean, I once hired a writer based on one scene he wrote in a script that was, it was fine, but there was one scene that was so spectacular that I hired, and it was a half hour comedy that I hired him based on that scene. So sometimes, sometimes it's not the whole, but that there's some spark that you can see from a writer. So other than friend specs, are, are you still open to reading other types of specs? Yeah. It's, it's yeah, it's not my favorite thing to do. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely, I mean, I once read, which I just thought was hilarious, somebody wrote a spec of that girl from a contemporary perspective, wow. mm -hmm. which was hilarious and really drew my attention. It was so unique and so special that even if it wasn't right, I've never forgotten her. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's inventive. That's cool. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a question here as, what is a mistake you feel first time writers make in any format? <laughs> Two things that I'll say. One of them is they say people's names too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's constantly this person, that person, hey, you know, it's all, they're always saying the other characters' names. Don't do that. The other mistake I find in comedies that people make, um, well, there's two of them beyond that. One of them is just because the character is a lawyer, doesn't mean that he or she speaks in lawyer speak. And the other thing I would say is that story has to have conflict and people forget that. There has to be conflict um, in order for there to be a dramatic build to, the ep to any episode. Mm -hmm. And I think people forget that. I feel, gosh, what's the, what's the biggest mistake? Um, or, or, or I feel like sometimes writing an episode in the absence of understanding the context of the episode that came before it and that will come after it. 
um, because I, as a showrunner, am reading it as part of a piece. Um, it's not going to exist on its own. It's not going to be, you know, the Academy nominated movie. It is part of a TV series. So to not, to ignore what has come before, um, whether that's, you know, action points that we've already covered or dialogue or a character's development um, and not to push it forward. You know, every, every time, at least in dramas, you, a script comes out, it changes the game. It changes the game radically. And these people that you've created are living creatures. And the way someone holds a word in their mouth is who they are in that moment. And once that script has been greenlit and it's gone off to production, what comes after it has to honor the new person that came before, the person that is actually in the story. So um, what's most frustrating is when writers, you know, are still stuck on some idea that they pitched, you know, back in the day when we were breaking six weeks before and they're not going with the flow. So um, continually staying on your feet and keeping, keeping awareness of these things are changing and shifting and living. And watch and days and understand how actors actually talk. Yeah, um, I think that's... Right to that right to that yeah i think that's absolutely right i just want to add one more thing i think the hardest thing to learn as a writer is how to do exposition gracefully um and that is something everyone has to think about all the time when they're right especially when they're writing a pilot how to do it gracefully and elegantly where it doesn't feel like exposition you know um so I, I th that is another mistake that, that young writers make is not paying enough attention to that. That's a good point, yeah. Um, I just saw a question I would love to respond to. And the question was, what are your thoughts on writer's assistants pitching, contributing in the room? Let me just say, for me, and this doesn't work for everybody, but for me, we try very hard to um, have our writer's assistants be part of the process, pitch jokes. Um, we give them scripts eventually. And we have four writers who used to be writer's assistants on the show, who are now full-fledged writers. Two of them are supervising co-EPs. I so believe, and partly because when you start as a writer's assistant, you understand not only the culture of the show, but the language of the show. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an amazing training ground. Um, so in, in my room, I encourage pitches. Um, if someone pushes the pitch, it gets a little annoying but I wholeheartedly encourage pitching. You know, can I just jump in really quickly? I, I wanted to circle back to something that Marta brought up, which I think was really important. Um, and uh, it, it came up in the earlier questions and it was around the whole digital streaming, Quibi, new world that's going to emerge and already is on our phones. Um, the whole advent of the apps and what that's going to mean to us in terms of shorter content. Um, I want to really encourage everybody because this was my experience. Like I, you know, I'm, I, I went to film school. I cut on a steam back, you know, I, you know, my shows are very slow, you know, and, and, and novelistic and unfold moment by moment by moment to the great annoyance to some people, but I like it that way. And then all of a sudden, Me too, Vina. I love it that way. Right. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Um, and then, and then all of a sudden be given a crayon box with magenta, like colored, you know, all this new stuff. What it means to me is we, these, these new forms that may get shorter over time are also an incredible opportunity because what I'm seeing is the shorter they get, the more you've got to produce. Right. So it won't mean, I don't think, the unemployment of us, I think it will mean the continual employment of us um, and the expansion of the art form. The addition, to, I don't think anyone's ever gonna be like, you know what, I'm not gonna be watching 
or maybe they will, who knows, but not me, will ever say, I don't want to watch a, a 60 minute story, but I will watch TikToks, you know, and now I will watch webisodes and, and I will watch quibbies. I will watch many different things, but the shorter forms allow us to play with a completely new toy um, and to try to embrace that. And especially for you guys out there, you know, I am not of the generation that grew up on Facebook, um, but for those who did and who are very good at understanding, you know, have an affinity for the short form for texting and, and webisodes and all of that, you guys will get, get to develop a completely new language. In the same way television was a push the art form, the advent of television brought radio plays into American living rooms filmed, right? Because television could not compete with the spectacle of cinema. So it's bread and butter had to be drama and drama evolved because of television. So that's, I think what this opportunity is right now for our industry and the art form. Um, I think it's, it's probably very different than what you're talking about, but I really appreciate what you've said. Um, I guess it's a, a, a slight connection. A number of years ago, there was a, a YouTube channel called Wix, where um, John Avnet and Rodrigo Garcia were encouraging women filmmakers and women writers to do five minute films. And I got to do, to write and direct three five minute shorts that were connected. It was, you know, basically a thing. And I have to agree with Vina. The, it was so liberating to think of story in a new way. And it was the first time in my life that I started writing something that I didn't know where it was going to end. Mm. It gave me a kind of freedom that I'd never had before to try to write in a new way. One thing I was curious of, because streaming services are also very data-driven tech companies, how much information, how much data um, are showrunners given about their shows? And how, does that impact the way you write seasons in any way? No. <laughs> no, I, I've never been one to think that the um, the, the viewers get to tell me what the show is. Um, how much do they tell you? Well, you know, Netflix has gotten better in just this past year where they've started talking about how many viewers and, you know, how many watched the first 13 episodes, how many binge them, how many watch them in this many weeks. You get a bunch of that information, but I've got to say, it doesn't inform what we do. It's great to hear if you're doing well, um, but it doesn't necessarily inform what we do because it doesn't give us information as to why and necessarily who we're talking about. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I appreciate the information, but even on network when you got your overnight information about how many viewers you had, it didn't really affect what you were doing that week. And I would think less so for Vina. Uh, I mean, I agree with you. It, it, I, it, I, there is, other than either I feel good or I feel like shit. Uh, <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, guys. Um, yeah, it's it's not it's not none of us write by committee. That's not what we do, right? Right. Yeah. Right. How are the notes process? I know people have said you know some some streamers absolutely leave you alone, some don't. What's been your experience with that? You know, I, I, I have a different perspective on notes than I think a lot of people. I'll take, I'm an idea whore. I'll take a good idea from anyone. If someone is having a problem, I don't have to like their solution. I don't even have to like the way they worded the problem, but I have to hear it. 
I may ultimately not agree, but I have to hear it. And I think everybody who's involved is only trying to make it better. Doesn't mean they're right, but everybody is in it for the same thing. Netflix in particular for me was an example of, um, they, their notes kept me honest and kept me true to my vision. That's what their notes did. They weren't trying to drive me in a different direction. And that's when I think network notes get frust or notes get frustrating when someone's trying to take a, a square episode and put it into a, a round show. Um, I think that's when they get frustrating. But, but if they are really there, if the notes are there to help you, they're so useful. Someone doesn't understand something, you got to listen to that. You are far more of an adult than I am. <laughs> 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 I like your perspective. <laughs> I want that to rub off on me. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I, as, I've, as I've kind of gone along, I think that the wisdom of that is true. Um, take the spirit of the note, you know, and and understand that if something is just not being understood instead of which I definitely do. And I know a lot of us do take things really personally and go crazy, you know? Um, and then if the marriage is good from the get go and you respect your executives and you're doing the same show, then it, it is no, it, it takes just, I need to eat some humble pie and just take the note. Not the solution. <laughs> Never. Never. Yeah. Vina, for um, a platform as new and innovative as Quibi, I mean, what were those conversations like in, in developing your series and, you know, the notes in that, uh, under that format, if any? This is, this is what the conversations were like. And this is why, um, and, and Marta, I really, I want to see your five minute, uh, I want to see your, your, your shorts, because this is what it felt like. It felt like, um, it felt like being, we were all beginners, you know, um, and that's a lot saying Jeffrey Katzenberg is a beginner, but we're all playing in this completely new sandbox where, um, you know, the length of episodes are not only shorter, but the vertical format necessitates a completely different way of storytelling. And we're literally, I think in the first few, um, I felt it with my show, just scratching the surface of what that means. So. Um, the excitement is, the exciting conversations were, okay, if I look at an image, if I look at two people talking on a vertical frame, I'm gonna feel so bored because I'm used to seeing horizontally. Our eyes are structured to watch horizontally. I see like this, but on a vertical frame, you're gonna get one person looking into like the end of the frame. And so what does that mean in terms of how do we rethink um, a conversation? So the way I, we had to, we, we kind of got into it was, what if you stack people in the conversation? So you stack, you know, someone sitting on a train, the, the, the two people having the conversation, someone sits behind another person, and so they're sitting like this, so you can shoot this way. And so thinking in terms of, instead of east-west and the widescreen, think of A to Z, so here to infinity. Like how far can a character physically go inside a frame? And so it was, it was fun. It was just, it was a whole other, like Marta said, half the time I didn't know what was going to happen. I got to play. I got to, you know, you get to like dodge and weave really fast. You have to, because it's, it's less real estate. It's a shorter field that you're running on, but also you get to think visually because ultimately we're visually storyteller, visual storytellers in a completely new way. Um, and that made conversations extraordinarily exciting to rethink, you know, and then then to like, look at how, how do we talk to each other anyway? Like in real life, do we literally go like this and talk to each other? Never, you know, we're sitting on a couch, no one's looking at each other, they're talking, you know, they're on their computers. So there's, it was, it, it, it forces you to put away the ideas you have about how we are and start either innovating them or looking to see how we actually do things. 
so that was the kind of conversations we had and that's so much fun that's so much fun to have that kind of conversation you know with with executives and and other artists who are part of the series and um, and actors too as both you're both direct have both directed things how does that inform your writing process you know um I had the opportunity to have lunch with James L. Brooks once, and he said that writers make good directors because they know where the story is. So I think if anything, the writing has informed, mm. and, and just, you know, the many years I've spent doing it, but the writing really tells, should tell the director um, where the story is. And it's your job as the director to um, portray that story in as visually a pretty way, as, as beautiful way as possible. I've, I've found too that um, directing, at the end of the day, you know, you get to set up the frame and you get to hire a great DP and you get to talk about visuals from here to kingdom come. And then you get on the set and your job is to go up to the actor and tell them what the hell's going on um, in as few words as possible. And so giving an actor an intention really clarifies when I'm a writer, when I'm sitting down to start a scene, what the hell is this about, you know, period, in the most simple, clear way. Um, we do a thing where we're writing where we read everything aloud in the writer's room um, because we need to know that even those who aren't real actors, even as, as you're reading it, you can feel the transitions, you can feel if things feel natural. Um, and I find that really ultimately helps the actor and the director um, because they're not having to fabricate transitions. Bina, there was a question for you. Is there a way you specifically write that kind of stacking on the page as opposed to making the decision while you're shooting or on in post? Yeah, I mean, so so if I need, if I know because of the format, the Quibi format, the vertical format that my, um, I can't do this, you know, every time someone has a conversation, I have to actually figure out why can't I do that, right? Um, oh, because they're running, you know, or because they're on a train or a bus um, or there's a mirror and she's fixing her makeup or he's fixing his makeup while they're having a conversation with Schmo on the bed. You know, so it, it affects the action of the scene, um, because if you're trying to do that on set by that, if, if you're in trouble, you know, that has to be thought up pretty intensely beforehand, because then, you know, that affects obviously production. We have a question. Um, how do you feel about writers groups if hearing your script out loud is best? Is there a point in career where, where that's no longer helpful? I think it's always helpful to hear your script out loud. I don't think it, there, there is a downside to that at all. Um, our, especially in comedy, um, it's not as much as in, in, in Vina's world about the visual. I mean, it is to a certain extent, but that's, it's really about the dialogue. So I think it's really important to hear it out loud. It's not uh, you, meant to be read, it's meant to be heard. Yeah, now you guys are way tougher than I think drama writers were pretty precious and sensitive about it all. <laughs> I, I, okay, so this is, this is my take. I feel that I, you know, I trust notes from people that I respect and that I share the same taste with. I mean, at the end of the day, everyone likes different stuff, right? And for me to give some, like the killing to my friend who can't stand blood and is terrified, of, I'm not gonna get good notes. She's just gonna be like, ew, this is horrible. God, you depress me, you know, like, um, so at the end of the day, I feel, I did once venture into a writer's group and, uh, and we read, the beginning act of a feature. And it was the most horrific experience. It was horrible um, for me. <laughs> um, and, and I realized partly is because I'm not 100% sure we all share the same taste. You know, um, we just have different tastes. So 
one person in the writers group was like, this is terrible. And, you know, just so mean and so, you know, and, and I guess that was his version of being honest, but yeah, didn't help. So I don't know. I personally like to go to um, people I trust and, and share the same taste and, um, and, and my writer's room, definitely, because, you know, I respect and trust them. Great. What do you both look for in a, in a good series, either, you know, as a viewer or as a producer developing um, a series? We know they're, they're very different questions. I have to say, I am someone who doesn't watch comedy. I watch The Killing. <laughs> That's what I love to watch. I mean, honestly, I, I don't watch a lot of comedies because it feels like work to me. Um, so, but the answer to what I would produce, look, I, at this point in my life, I don't need to produce anything that I don't feel passionately about. Something I want to say, something I want to try, um, some fresh perspective. Um, I, I, there's no point in doing it just for the sake of doing another show at this point in my life. I really want to do something I'm passionate about and hopefully that passion will inspire other people and we'll be able to get more shows on the air. Wow, I, I, um, I do not watch dramas. Um, <laughs> <See>? Interesting. <laughs> it's work, it's work. Right? I, watch Deep, I watch Getting On, I watch Friends. Right? I'm so glad everyone in the world now is watching Friends. Like my 14 year old, 15 year old nieces are watching Friends. Like it's, yeah, I watch comedies. And, and, and then my guilty pleasure is The Real Housewives, you know? Um, so <laughs> do not watch dramas. Um, and the same thing. I think, I think we're, we're, we're really lucky and I feel lucky to be able to live at this time where it is the golden age and, 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 and the, the, it's, the wild west is open and we get to, you know, as much as we can and want to create different stories. Um, so it's a great time. It's a really great time to be a writer. Yeah, we get to play. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any last pieces of advice that you have for anyone trying to break in in as a both as either a comedy or a drama writer? Um, you know, I just I, I two quick things. One is I want to um, say how much I admire Vina. Likewise, and I'm so happy to be doing this with you. Um, you know, the biggest thing I can say to any writer is follow your heart. Mm -hmm. Follow your heart because if you're doing somebody else's idea, you're never gonna make it yours. Follow your heart, whatever it is. Beautiful, I agree. Um, and I too am so honored to be with you, um, you. during this time. This is, it's, it's a real pleasure. Um, yeah, follow your heart. You know, I made the mistake on one script. Someone said, do this for blank de blank. And I wasted six months writing something that I didn't care about, you know, um, and it didn't work and it didn't go. And everything, not everything, but many things that I've loved have seen the light of day. And, and because we love them, you know, and we see them and we fight for them. And the other thing I just want to say, because I felt this so keenly and I see it in your questions, um, just keep just keep going, you know, like keep going. It might feel like it's so hard to break into this industry. It is. It is one of the most difficult industries in the world. But what I see, and this breaks my heart, is people give up right before they're about to get in, right before they're about to get some great opportunity or right when they've gotten it and then they pull back. So just, just keep going guys, you know, um, just keep going. Thank you both for spending an hour with us. Um, you. you guys are on Netflix, please check out all six seasons that are on um, for Grace and Frankie. Do you know when the seventh season will premiere yet, Marta? No, no yet. Not yet. Well, look out for that and please go to quibi.com, sign up for it. If you sign up for it before April 6th, you get 90 days free, I believe. That's true. So you can 
check out Vina's new show. What's it called, Vina? What's your show called? It's called The Stranger. Great. Thank you both so much. Thank and thank you guys for viewing. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You Thanks too. for the thoughtful questions. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Be safe.